Water, the source of life, the heart of civilization, habitat for many livings. There are numerous ways we can emphasize the vital role water plays in our lives and for our globe. Therefore, it has also been a heated topic among different groups, states and civilizations. Today we will think over whether water fosters cooperation or exacerbates conflicts and even wars and come up with some ways and solutions to cope with possible challenges. Great ancient civilizations were established on waterlands, especially around big rivers, as the map shows. When huge empires were reigning over huge territories, it was maybe easier to control the water resources that were abundant. However, today there are many transboundary waters flowing through several states such as Nile and Danube rivers. This increased the number of disputes between states as well as the need for effective communication and cooperation. Throughout the presentation, we will claim that water is more likely a source of peace than war. There are several concepts to be covered as a reason for that, most important of which is power. Power is the key factor in analyzing interstate relations including water related issues. How power is distributed between states explains a lot about the nature of conflict or cooperation about water resources. Basically, powerful states control most of the transponder waters and how they are utilized usually at the expense of others. The concept of hydrohegemony by Zaytun and Warner is useful here, which is based on power and hegemony relations. Hydrohegemons can act as a leader by giving some benefits to other riparians or they can be dominant and encroach upon others' rights. Either way, the result is that water is used by the powerful state and proportional to others. The question is how this approach prevents conflicts or wars and secure peace. Historically we know that wars over water resources are rare and there isn't even a case where water is the main result of a war. This being said, the dominance of a hydrohegemon doesn't secure the peace completely. The theory also examines the intent of conflicts between states and the result is that although there isn't any wars or violence over water, some degrees of disputes are usually remained. As Zaytun and Miramach also argue, the cooperation and conflict exist together with varying degrees. This is a logical conclusion because the authority and coercive power of the hegemon prevent other states to be violent since the outcomes will be worse for them, but the discomfort still remains due to the unfair allocation and utilization of water. An archaic example of a dominant hegemon country is Israel. Israel has both the advantage of being an upstream country and having superior material and political power against Palestine. Israel uses many times more water than Palestinians do from the river and is not very open to talks and cooperation. Socially and economically over the underprivileged Palestinians apparently need and want access to more water. However, Israel continues to use as a dominant hegemon as much water as it desires and weak Palestinian state doesn't have much chance to oppose it. Again, there is no war over the water, yet the tensions remain high between two states, of course also because of many other reasons. Then, in this type of a hegemonic relation, what are the chances for weaker states? First of all, weak and most of the time downstream riparians should realize that power relations are not constant and they can challenge the powerful countries with different methods. Their challenge will foster cooperation and possibility of a better solution. As Kaska and Zaytun also demonstrates, even though they don't have much material or geographical advantage, downstream repairs still hold a considerable amount of bargaining power and they need to use it effectively. They should maintain talks and negotiations with the hegemon in all aspects so that they can come up with wise conditions and agreements for both. Moreover, water issues should be evaluated in a broader context including other political economical problems and the impact of external powers like other states and international institutions. If you look at again our Jordan River example, Palestine seems to have some bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis Israel based on religious and ideological factors. Palestine can take also support of various states and institutions that are already concerned of Israel's actions. In this way, a better and fairer solution could be achieved. Another important factor contributing to durable peace is institutions. The number of international institutions have increased immensely, especially after the Second World War, as well as their capacity and effectiveness. They play a vital role in solving interstate conflicts and ensuring the permanence of peace. As Aronwolf indicates, institutions are necessary to solve water conflicts and to adapt states to the substantial structural changes 
His study also highlights that cooperation clearly outperforms conflict when it comes to transponder water problems. Here, institutions help in several ways. First, they facilitate communication between repairers and consequently, establishment of possible agreements. Accompanied by institutional efforts, parties can more easily reach a common understanding. Secondly, international institutions are effective to measure and oversee the implementation of treaties and collective policies. This forces states to do their duties more attentively. Moreover, institutions can provide dispute resolution mechanisms when states are unlikely to come to an agreement. This accelerates the problem-solving process and incentivizes states to cooperate. Established with the aim of securing peace in the whole world, the United Nations is the biggest international organization with a broad scope including water. UN Water Courses Convention, adopted by the General Assembly in 1997 and came into force in 2014, established the core of the rules and procedures regarding transboundary waters. UN helps states by mitigating conflicts, mediation and dispute resolution organs like International Court of Justice. Repairing states should always take into account the provisions of UN and other international bodies to have fair and peaceful agreements. An example of a river basin specific international organization is Zambezi Water Course Commission, SAMCOM. Although there have been tension between repairing countries, they didn't turn into violence, and the establishment of ZAMCOM in 2014 eased the tensions and raised cooperation. Zambezi River Basin includes eight repairing countries and is located in the world's one of the poorest regions. Therefore, ZAMCOM was a huge success for addressing the critical problems of the region and securing peace. Samcom's objective is to promote the equitable and reasonable utilization of the water resources of the Zambezi watercourse as well as the efficient management and sustainable development thereof. The commission also concerns with environmental problems and protection of the wildlife within the basin. Considering its scope and all riparians' active participation in it, Samcom is a good example of an intergovernmental organization dealing with transponder waters. To conclude, in analyzing water-related conflicts and cooperation, we need to examine power relations between states. The theory of hydrohegemony is useful in most cases, but not enough per se. As historical data suggests, wars due to water disputes are unlikely. This is because hegemos forces others to obey its terms, while also other riparians can have considerable bargaining power. Furthermore, power relations are prone to changes, and negotiation is pursued by weak and downstream countries all the way. On the top of it, international institutions are stronger than ever and they are constant suppliers of stability. The result is that water is definitely a source of cooperation that induces peace for all. So far it has been so and we hope that it will be so forever.